Hey guys, Cliff the Lazy Geek here. Welcome back to the channel. And today we are going to take the Sea Star S50 Smart Telescope and push it to the limit from here in Tokyo, one of the most light polluted city on the planet. Obviously, light pollution makes astrophotography and astronomy difficult, so it makes the job of this poor little smart telescope, sorry for slapping you, a bit more uh, difficult, actually, a lot more difficult than a typ typical suburban area uh, across the world. Uh, still not as bad as Singapore on, or Hong Kong on the Hong Kong Island, I would assume. So I'm still, I'm, I'm still lucky. How are we going to push this little guy to the limits? So what I've done is I have taken images using this little uh, thing's internal light pollution filter, which is actually a dual band narrow band filter, uh, on two emission nebula. One was the Veil Nebula. Uh, I think it was the Western Veil side of the uh, Veil Nebula. And I've also taken an image of what we call the Wizard Nebula, which is a, a favorite of mine, and which I always had as an amateur astrophotographer starting out trouble to capture and I was very surprised to see that we do get a decent result with this with no work whatsoever it feels like cheating and I'm almost annoyed that something like this exists to make all of my hard work easy and so taking images of the Veil Nebula I actually pointed that smart telescope to the Veil Nebula for a full 20 minutes of imaging and actually, and this is the main drawback on the main thing that frustrates me with this telescope at this stage, it is the overhead of imaging. I got 20 minutes worth of imaging, but it took me around 30 minutes to do so because the telescope sometimes it takes a 10 second exposure on the target. And for whatever reason, it doesn't add it to its stack, to its light accumulation algorithm. It's likely because there are star trails or the tracking didn't go right or that kind of stuff. But it's a bit frustrating that you have to spend 30 minutes to get just 20 minutes of stack data. That said, for most users, it doesn't really matter. It's very transparent. And also ZW is working on an update where the individual raw frames, the raw files coming from the telescope will be saved individually or have the option to save them individually. So we could see what's wrong with each of the frames maybe stack them if they're slightly like bad tracking and probably like kind of recover some of that lost overhead. Time will tell. Right now there is a bit of overhead. And on the Wizard Nebula, I let it point uh, at the Wizard Nebula for around like two hours, 20 minutes, something like that. And I got a stack of around one hour and 40 minutes on the Wizard Nebula with this little thing. So what are we going to do next? Well, this little thing costs uh, 500 US dollars. And of course, it gave me a pretty decent result for each of those objects directly out of the scope automatically on my smartphone. I'll put the images on the screen so you can see how they look like. But then what we're going to do to push those images to the limit is I'm going to, pr to process them in a piece of software called uh, PixInsight, uh, which is an astrophotography dedicated piece of software. I bought it something like seven, eight years ago, I don't remember. It's super expensive. It's amazing, but it's really for hardcore, crazy astrophotographers. I'm also going to use some plugins on this piece of, sof of software, uh, which are uh, paid plugins as well. And the total cost of the software that I'm going to be using to push the images that this took to the limit is a bit more than 500 US dollars. <laughs> so yeah, this is getting really overkill, but it really tells you like the real potential of this product. And there are some pieces of software that, that are much cheaper and maybe, and some of them are even free, like Cyril, that can go a large part of the way to my processing. But for now, I'm going to going to use Fix Insight, which is what I am the most familiar with. And so let's go inside together and push this telescope and its images to the limit. Before we do that, I want to let you know that if you're going to buy this or you have a telescope or you're doing astrophotography or you want to take images of stars, your images will get 10% better if you subscribe to my channel, like the video and leave a comment. Of course, it will get 10% uh, better. Absolutely guaranteed. No, of course not. But whatever, it's going to get better. Uh, so yeah, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a like. It truly helps the channel out. And if you want to even support the channel more, you can join my Patreon link down in the description or join the channel as a member. It really, truly makes the channel possible. Thank you so much to everyone. Anyway, with that, let's get inside. 
Okay, I'm at my computer. I've opened PixInsight, the software that we're going to use to push our C-Star S50 to the limit. And those are the two images I got. So the one on the left is actually the Western Veil Nebula. The one on the right is the Wizard Nebula. You wouldn't be able to tell because they are very, very black. You can see some spots of light, which are stars. But that's actually very interesting. This is because the C-Star S50 saves those images as raw frames and a camera sensor it only counts photons linearly that arrive to its pixels whether our eyes they do further processing when when we're looking at stuff they do some contrast adjustment they do what we call stretching of the image and uh, that's what we're gonna do with this as well and PixInsight has a way to automatically stretch the image and it can stretch the image with the red, green, and blue color channels separately. And internally, this is what the ZW C-Star S50 also does uh, to achieve its uh, image. So let's apply this uh, automatic stretch of the image. And there we have the two images. On the left, we can see the Veil Nebula. On the right, we have the Wizard Nebula. Uh, the, those two are difficult targets in light polluted cities. So it really says something that I was able to capture that from Tokyo. By the way, you probably don't see the wizard in this weird nebula there. So let me do something. I am going to rotate that image 180 degrees and zooming it on uh, and zooming in on it a little bit the wizard is actually more kind of like a baby wizard i don't know if you'll be able to see it this is the nose the eye of the wizard we can kind of see a pointy hat here and then the baby hands there so think of it as a baby doing a <laughs> kind of thing so this is the uh, wizard nebula and just like that, because we're being able to do that from the raw frames on the PC, I think I, we are already getting better results than just from the C-Star S50, but this is overpowered software. What's also very good is that those raw images saved by the C-Star embed their uh, pointing information. So we, the software can read the metadata from the image and figure out exactly where each image was, I mean, where the telescope was pointed at for each image. So I don't need to tell the software where the target is located. That's very good because it allows us to do uh, what we call a spectrophotometric color calibration. Basically, the software looks at uh, the stars in each ima image compares the stars to a database of star images that uh, we know the uh, spectrum of and then adjusts the colors to match that spectrum. So I can do that on both of those images. And we are done. One of the things we can notice, by the way, is that the edges of the image have this kind of like weird noise there, right? Uh, and we, we see the same thing for, for that image. This area looks noisier than the rest. And this is perfectly normal. This is due to a phenomenon called field rotation. And it is unavoidable with that particular telescope and with any telescopes that track stars by just moving horizontally and vertically. To convince yourself of that, you can think of the constellation of Cassiopeia that looks like a W, or an M in the night sky, and maybe in the early evening, if you look at it, it's going to be a W, but it's like going to rotate around the celestial pole, and by the early morning, you're looking at it, and it's an M, and your own neck and head, it can only move like up and down and left and right, so it's only able to track Cassiopeia throughout the night if you are standing still and just like always looking at Cassiopeia throughout the night in your field of view it rotates from a W to an M and if you wanted to avoid that you would need to take your head and <laughs> rotate it like that in rhythm with the uh, constellation and this particular telescope it would need to rotate the sensor within and it's actually possible with like a rotator but it's not built into this telescope and so because of that the target while we were taking the exposure was rotating slightly and so the edges of the image are affected by that rotation. This rotation will be more visible the longer we spend imaging a single image and it forces us to kind of crop the image. So that's what I'm going to do. You can see the wizard nebula there. I can just uh, crop it to just the, uh, the baby wizard here because it looks fine like that. And for the Western Veil Nebula, I'm just going to leave it like that. There's a little bit of, uh, of noise here in the corner of my crop, but should be fine. And here it is with the crop. So now we have cropped the images to just like our desired 
uh, object and we can start doing a little bit more processing on those. My first step will be using a noise reduction algorithm. It's actually an AI based algorithm that will selectively blur the image while trying to keep as much of the details available. So I can apply it to the Vel Nebula and to the Wizard Nebula as well. Right now our images are much less noisy than they were before. And I will also apply an AI based deconvolution tool. So it it's a tool that uses AI to approximate a mathematical deconvolution formula. And what this does, it, it will shrink the stars so that the stars are tighter, which provides a more pleasant image. And also it will try to eke out the details that are available in the image without inventing new details. And after applying the tool, you can see the stars are much tighter and neater than before. Now, up to now, we've been working on the what we call the linear state of the image, meaning the image straight out of the sensor. And the way that we're looking at the image right now, it's just an illusion. If I remove the uh, temporary stretch function or the display only stretch function, you can see the images are still black. To our eyes, they look like nothing. Now we need to apply a permanent stretch to the image. And that's what I just did using a simple script that is available for PixInsight, although PixInsight has tons of very customizable tools to achieve that, that stretch. It's all too complicated for someone like me who is very lazy. And so I just used a script and you can see that the stretching is a bit softer than what we were working with earlier than that display only stretch. And this uh, lets you have a, a darker background. The next step, now that the images are, st are stretched, is very similar to what we do to do image processing in software like Photoshop. And it's going to be color, saturation, brightness, contrast adjustments uh, throughout the, uh, the images. It's gonna take a little bit of time, so I'm not going to spend much time on it in this video, but I'll show a little bit of a fun thing that I do with the Wizard Nebula, uh, which is we're gonna, the, the Wizard Nebula, even though when you look at it right now, it looks like it's pretty much only pink and red. If you decompose it into red, green, and blue, it actually contains a lot of green and blue. And in particular, we're gonna use a process that pours out that green pulls out that blue so that we can have a color palette that mimics the color palette, palette that's used for Nebula from the Hubble Space Telescope, for instance. And to do so, I first want to remove the stars. And so to remove the stars, I'm going to use yet another AI-based tool uh, to uh, remove the stars, but I'll be replacing them into the image later. You can see there's tons of steps that can be done to really push this little telescope to the limit, but it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, and uh, it's a very expensive software and plugins. So is it all worth it? For me, yes, because it's a lot of fun. But for most people, honestly, the out of the scope images are perfectly nice. Anyway, you can see I've removed the uh, stars. We now have the star layer separate from the actual image. And now I'm gonna switch the colors to pull out that blue and that green, which will make our reds a bit yellower. And then maybe those areas will have a lot bl more blue. So let's do that. And bah, you can see immediately we've changed the color palette. We haven't, uh, you know, changed the fundamental data. We've just lowered the red reds and pulled everything else to the front. And then I can do some further color processing on that using things like color masks. Like here, I've actually added a mask that selects mostly the yellowish areas. And then I can apply some weird curves on red and green and apply it and poof, we get like a redder image. And then I could uh, get the blue side of the image and do the same thing. And here we are, and then we can play with contrast, etc., etc. do a lot of things, but it's actually a lot of work and very difficult to repeat ac accurately. So I have already pre-processed those images prior to the video, and that is like the end result. But this is with the exact same techniques that I've been showing. If I were to keep doing it live, I would end up spending like an hour uh, adjusting curves. I didn't want to do that. So here are the images of our little uh, baby wizard. Here on the right, we can see the nose better, the eye, the hat, the little tiny cute little hands, and of course our veil nebula on the left. Now some might say this is over-processed because the background is too 
too dark, etc. But that's the whole point. It is to taste. And with that, I will leave you with some zoom ins to these two images. I hope you enjoyed and I hope to you enjoyed this video pushing the ZLU C-Star S50 to the limit with software that costs more than the telescope itself because I'm an idiot. Uh, with that, don't forget to subscribe, click that bell icon, like and comment on the video what are your, your, your thoughts on that. But more important than that, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.